Hi guys, I'm Charles Brownstein from northerntransmissions.com. Thank you for checking out another episode of Records in My Life. This time we have on the one and only Ira Kaplan from Yola Tango. Let's see what he's going to talk about. Hi, I'm Ira from Yola Tango. This is Records in My Life on northerntransmissions.com. Well, I thought the first record that came to mind was uh, Kick Me Hard by NRBQ. NRBQ were a band that that mattered to me a huge amount starting in high school and through the present day. Uh, I was actually exposed to their music first by uh, the older brother of a friend of mine. Her, his band played a couple of songs that I was like, you know, I tended to know the cover songs they were doing. It's like, what are those songs? And that turned out they were by NRBQ from their record Scraps. So that was the first record I heard by them. But then I went to see them, and just a mind-bogglingly great, criminally underappreciated band uh, playing uh, standards. I mean, they were, you know, it's the first time I heard songs like Rockin' and Rhythm by Duke Ellington, uh, by Thelonious Monk. First time I heard them was them covering Thelonious Monk, but also doing just crazy song poems. I have a just a cherished memory of seeing them with all the band members have their own dolls, figurines that look like them, and the drummer and the keyboard player were singing Mellow Yellow to each other with the figurines. It was just the most ridiculous stuff with the most sublime stuff and fantastic songwriters as well. And on Kick Me Hard was when they went kind of it felt like a record that they'd done entirely for themselves. That they, it had a, they took a song by Alvin and the Chipmunks, the things we like to do, and rewrote the lyrics for things they like to do. And it was it was really poignant. I mean, it was like they could find the poignance in Alvin and the Chipmunks. I mean, actually, that's easy. Everyone can find the poignance in Alvin and the Chipmunks, but a special a special uh, form of it. Uh, it's just a, a remarkable band and a great record. I'll say the um, the clean uh, which one do I want to say compilation. Yes, the compilation is very special to me because it's how I was exposed to them. They uh, a friend of mine uh, gave me in Georgia a cassette of it, a pre-recorded cassette. Said, you know, I think you might like this, and we just like, flipped over every song, and just uh, a magical record that we've. Um, been fortunate enough to get to play with them extensively. In fact, we were in Vancouver with them probably in, I'm not going to come up with the right year, but we did tour with them and we've toured with various members of the band as well as without the whole group, but uh, um, just the best. <laughs> well, as long as I'm on the topic of brothers. Actually, this will be the third brother band in a row, come to think of it. <laughs> and the Kinks, a uh, gigantic band in my life. I mean, it was... Uh, I had become kind of casually a fan of theirs and definitely interested in them when, kind of for years, I, there was just something about them that I found intriguing. And uh, there used to be this series of shows in New York City in the summertime in Central Park and it's a very posh neighborhood. So the people who lived in rock band uh, hearing distance of the park were not thrilled by this series. So the, the deal was the show started, they were kind of over by the time it was dark. I mean, it was in the summer, it gets dark around like 8.30 or so, and shows were over by 9, which growing up in the suburbs was perfect for me because I could take the train to the show and come back without kind of having to negotiate too much with my parents about, <laughs> you know, curfews and things. And the shows were underwritten by, uh, by a beer company, so they were remarkably inexpensive. So... The Kinks had played at Carnegie Hall and they had played at Philharmonic Hall, more fancy venues in New York. And I didn't know anybody who wanted to go see them and I 
so I didn't go. But then they were doing the Central Park series. I thought, you know, I don't. At this point, I don't care. I'm just going to go, and I'll be home at ten thirty, and it'll cost me two dollars. And uh-huh. so, and it was just, it was life changing. I mean, I just had never seen a band perform that way. I mean, I'd seen a bunch of shows, but nothing. They they seemed like they didn't care. <laughs> they were just so shambolic and taking these remarkable songs, some of which I discovered I knew that day, it was that, that evening. It was like hearing, I mean, specifically Sunny Afternoon, I remember them playing. It was like, that's the kinks. You know, I knew You Really Got Me and I knew Lola and I knew uh, A Well-Respected Man, but was just scratching the surface of what that band was and uh, was just obsessed from the, that moment on. And uh, like the next day, uh, my mom took me to, like, to the department store and I got uh, the King's Chronicles, which uh, remains kind of the, the talismanic record of, of, of them for me. I mean, partly because I bought it that day, but also because it's a, a really well put together collection of their greatest period, face to face, through uh, Lola. Here. I'll say the uh, despite the lack of brothers in the group, I'll, uh, I'll uh, say the uh, the Sun Ra singles collection. Um, I mean, the Sun Ra section of our record collections just keeps growing, and it gives every indication of being a, a bottomless fount of uh, remarkable music of just all types and um, but I mean I knew that they did lots of things they did the the wild free things they did the Walt Disney songs they did the you know the big band I mean the, the great singing songs but then heard the singles collection and found out that they also did blues and doo-wop and R&B and just th- there is no um no end. A current band uh, from New York called $75 Bill has one record out on the other music label, so you can't you can't miss it. And uh, they're uh, it's a duo. The this guy uh, Che is just a remarkable guitar player who plays in this style, just kind of kind of bluesy but then also like droney and uh, he, he went to Africa and took guitar lessons and got his um, guitar refretted for microtones I mean he's drawing on kind of all seemingly disparate styles but when he plays them he's doing them all at once and it makes perfect sense I mean it's, it's just a, a really special guitar player and he's his partner in the band is Rick Brown, who is a, a very old friend of ours, Rick. And Rick has a couple of, I think they're homemade double reed instruments that he's he plays. Uh, I think probably explicitly influenced by like some of the things the horn playing Beefheart did. But uh, and he's got some shakers and things like that. But his main instrument is a box. And he sits on a box and just takes sticks and shakers and just beats on this box that he built. But it, it's incredible what, what they're doing. And uh, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll have other musicians sit in with them sometimes, and that's great. But just what the two of them do is terrific. And this record is beautiful. So I think it's, it might be called Wooden Bag. I'm going to go out on a, on a limb and say it's Wooden Bag, but I might be wrong. It's on other music, uh, yeah. other music recording yeah. company. Yeah, they're not.